Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. I launched a new series on Workology focused on women at work. It's a combination of articles, podcasts, and conversations like this one centered around celebrating women in the workplace. We do need to be celebrated more now than ever. We have so much stress, juggling multiple jobs, projects, family, life. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. So let's talk about how we manage all that's going on and celebrate each other and lift women up. My guest today is Cy Wakeman. She's a dynamic international keynote speaker, business consultant, New York Times bestselling author, and global thought leader with over 25 years of experience cultivating revolutionary new approaches to leadership. She is a author of multiple books and also has her own podcast called No Ego. Cy, welcome to the Workology podcast. Thanks, Jessica. Great topic, and I love the new focus for your podcast. It's it's been a lot of fun. We've done some articles, and I have a uh, imposter syndrome podcast that aired recently. So a lot of good conversations focused on women. That's such a great topic. We all can relate to imposter syndrome. Let's talk a little bit about your background. Tell us all about you, and and uh, if they don't know who you are already, which they should. Absolutely. Quick background. A lot of people don't know this, but um, I say the studied international relations and third world economic development, I wanted to go in the Peace Corps and help a women with micro lending programs, which are today a really accepted thing, but back then they're revolutionary. Um, life changes, things change. And so I went back to school and um, started life as a therapist and worked in uh, behavioral health care as part of a medical center, got promoted into leadership realized there wasn't a lot of connection between what we were telling leaders to do and what I taught people in my therapy office um, was healthy. And so I started to just start to modernize leadership philosophy in my own practice. And now I've become pretty well known for researching drama and uh, updating people's leadership philosophies. Well, let's maybe start off by kind of giving people a baseline of maybe kind of your points of view on on leadership velocity and, and some of the topics that you touch on. Sure. You know, in my research, I found that the average person spends two and a half hours a day in drama. So for those in HR, that's 816 hours per headcount per year huge impact. For those in recruiting, you know, I've worked with an organization, they had 200 open positions. And when we just figured instead of recruiting more people into the drama, if they just recaptured that emotional waste of drama and upcycled it, took that 816 hours a year, just part of it and recaptured it, that it completely eliminated the need for a single new position. So I think sometimes recruiters are recruiting into this portal for drama and you know they they feel like they're just bringing more bodies into the 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 mess and and they're not going to get ahead so i when i figured out there's that much drama i looked at what we're doing as far as leadership development engagement change management to try and help people you know diffuse the drama and what i found out in almost everything we're teaching in leadership is that we're fueling the drama not diffusing it and all comes down to how we help or we enable people to stay in their lowest self and their ego rather than call people up to greatness and then problem solve from there so i uh, my basic philosophy is there's this incredible workplace beyond ego that is not about venting or tattling or scorekeeping, um, but it's collaborative and innovative, and we can get there with the same people we have for the most part, but we've got to lead them differently. So it's interesting that you mentioned this ego-free free zone. There's an article that just published yesterday on CNN that came out as saying that nearly half of employees have, com- have committed revenge at work, and that includes 36% of entry-level workers, 45% of senior managers and 38% of general managers. That's crazy. And and here's the deal is most of what we're creating revenge for never happened. 
it's our story, not our reality. So let's say um, you and I were together, Jessica, and you said to me, I'm going to make sure we're both involved in this meeting. You get in the meeting and things just get carried away. You're brainstorming. You're still including me and my department, but you're making good progress. And it just doesn't dawn on you to stop the meeting and bring me in. If I stick with the story, I'm like, Jessica and I have a great working relationship and I choose to trust her call and she got in a meeting and did what she needed to do and nothing's really changed and she can debrief with me and we can figure out next steps to make sure our areas are included and on board. My ego gets in there and goes, she sold me out. She did this crap on purpose. I can't trust her. She says one thing and does another. I will show her. And then the revenge starts. But the revenge isn't based on our reality that you went into a meeting with good intention and carried our agenda forward. The revenge is based on my ego story that I get into fear and you sold me out. And now you're one up and you're just taking care of yourself. And now I'm going to get revenge and get other people to block your attendance and all that drama came from my story, me believing my own thinking, me believing my ego narrative, which is always a distorted view of reality. Not that was ever wronged. I was never wronged. So how do we get beyond that ego story and that ego narrative and, and, and get beyond that to help lessen or, and hopefully eliminate the drama? There's some simple stuff, and one is quit believing everything you think. Most of us don't realize how often our ego is out to play, and we really believe our own thinking. Just because it crossed your mind doesn't mean it's true. So, you know, everybody talks about space between what happened and your reaction. It's not just time and space. It is active inquiry, self-reflection, personal curiosity to say, is that true? Can I possibly know this to be true? What part of this is motive and fear and um, story? And so stop believing everything you think. Whenever you're in stress, question it and get yourself back to neutral. You don't even have to get great. Just get back to a neutral place and comfortable with what is without assigning motive or judgment or story or without thinking, here's how it's going to play out in the future. Just present moment now, neutral, unhooked, then look expansively with a belief system that how could this be happening for my highest good? If the universe is happening in my favor, people are generally good. Like how can I move without fear boldly into the future? And especially for women, we get fearful and we cave on one another instead of being bold, inclusive, collaborative. And then when we get fearful, not stepping back and instead saying, I choose to believe in my relationships with others, in my skill set where I can work through conflict. I, I'm going to move forward with neutrality and without all the scary story. So I feel like what you're saying is that there's a lot of things that are inside us, inside our head, inside our feelings and our own personal insecurities that are driving a lot of this drama. It is, and it's a natural part of us. It's our ego. Our ego is like wearing a pair of prescription glasses that is the wrong prescription. It distorts our view on the world. It's our color commentary. So I walk by someone and they don't say hello. All I know for sure is they didn't say hello. And that's it. Now, quantum physics would say they didn't even walk by you. So much of what we know, we don't know. But let's say they walk by me and don't say hello. I have nothing to make of that. I can conserve my energy and move on. But my ego, my thinking will narrate that. And it will say, ever since she got that promotion, she's rude. She thinks she's all that in a bag of chips and can't talk to the little people. Now, the key here is, is I don't know that to be true. My ego made that up and I give all my power away when I believe my own thinking. So when I believe that, I treat her rudely. She responds and treats me rudely. And then I can say, see, I'm right about stuff I make up. And my ego gets reinforced that I'm the victim. She's the villain. Um, I am helpless. If I can, as especially as women, just give people the benefit of the doubt and just if I have to make up a story, I could just believe that she didn't see me. She's deep in prayer and meditation for peace in the world. 
Then I treat her well, she responds well, and I'm right about stuff I made up. See, most women want to be empowered. And what I tell them is step into the power they already have. Your superpower is um, this co-creation. So if I can just be neutral, like our, our Buddhist friends would teach us, that walk by happens, assign no motive, conserve energy, move on. In women, we have an overactive part of our ego that is making sense of the world to always figure, are we safe? Are we safe? Does she still like me? Is he still on my side? Is there something I don't know about? We've become very paranoid because we believe our, our thinking. And the best thing I can tell women to do is up your skill set so that you, not with ego, I know best, but you can be confident that you bring something to the table that together we can create something amazing. And, um, you know, men have this issue too, but I see women in this unique um, way not realize the power that they have called co-creation. It's not your walk by that creates our results. It's whether or not I accept my ego's version of the world and respond accordingly. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just kind of trying to like work through all this stuff because I feel like I, I as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking, okay, that interaction that I had with my spouse this morning that maybe didn't go the way that I thought it was going to go or that, you know, he left those dirty pants on the floor to spite me might not be really exactly the reality of, of what in fact really occurred. Yeah. He might have just, um, left his pants right where it was easiest for him when he got that phone call. And if we loved our spouse, wouldn't it be a better storyline to say, you know, he was busy this morning. I'm glad he found some shortcuts and life hacks that made his morning quicker. No, I like that. I like that. I'm, I'm going to think about that tonight as we're, we're spending the evening together with my family. So let's think about maybe not just women and think about bosses and maybe senior leadership. How do we engage and maybe help eliminate the drama with them? Because it's not like I can just send out a memo that says, okay, no more drama, CEO, senior leadership team, uh, director of marketing that I feel like um, likes to kind of cause and stir up trouble, what can we do as individuals? There's a couple of things. One, first of all, with your boss, with anybody, stop judging, start helping. So I can take a phone call from my boss that just says, Sai, you know, can I have some additional detail on your progress on this project? And my ego turns that into he's a micromanager and treats me like a child. If my real need is one-on-one, -on -one, I would like him to check in with me less. I don't go with judgment and say, you're a micromanager. Can you please stop? I need my work environment. I need more freedom. I go to them and say, I understand that you have a need for um, detail. What can I do to raise your confidence in me so that you feel more comfortable checking in less? One is you're judging and need to change them. The other one is you're accepting your reality and you're willing to step up and alter your way to change your outcome. Very different because most people cite that the reason they can't succeed is that senior leadership isn't perfect. And yet I'm in 200 companies a year and senior leadership's never perfect. And so what I can do for my team is stop judging, start helping. If let's say the marketing group came out and said, we absolutely are going to completely support this part of the organization. They're our top priority. And we call about that piece of information and they go, you know, for today, we can't get that to you. We have other things we're working on. If I'm an ego and judgment, I can go, ha ha hypocrisy. Um, this is another example of how they don't support us. Or I can ask my team to get very clear about what they need, stop judging, start helping, and you know, try another avenue to say, well, I know that we both agree this is priority, and so is there something that we could do to help you get this you know, higher to the top of what's the urgent list? There's two ways to go through getting people to align and act differently. One's joy and one's misery. We get to choose joy and we get to choose rather than always being the victim of senior leaders being hypocritical or unsupportive or sources of drama. 
what I know is that people can't get into drama without my permission. So with, I'm a, if I'm with a senior leader and they are complaining about sales, I can just ask them these really great questions for self-reflection to get us closer to the truth. Like, what do you know for sure? And what could you and I do next to help? And, um, you know, is there any part of this that is hearsay or story? Or um, rather than focusing on why we can't, what are some ideas that you have in mind for how we could, or what would you like to see differently? If I can move even my senior leaders from venting to self-reflection, I've bypassed that ego, and I really have them focusing on the truth and what we can do next to help. And so no one can get into drama with you without your permission. There are no victims of drama. I love that. And I, I gosh, I'm like, no wonder you're a therapist. I feel like everything <laughs> that you're, you're sharing, it's like this, these light bulbs are, are going on. And, uh, there's, I think everyone that's listening has a piece of that, that they can learn. I'm just thinking about all my conversations I've had in just, you know, the beginning of this week, it's uh, Tuesday here, uh, for the live recording. There is a, a definitely different approach that I can take. And I love how you say like, what can I do to help you next? Or what can I, what, what would you like to do to see differently? Like they are coming up with the solution and they're telling you exactly what they need and you're the one asking the question. Absolutely. And the cool thing about this is this is teachable and everybody has kind of a low self when they're in ego and drama and a high self in the same body. There's just like this toggle switch that you have any given day with your husband, you could be looking at his jeans on the floor and thinking he doesn't respect me in our marriage and maybe I shouldn't even be here. And if I get sick and old, will he even be able to take care of me? Like now you're stressed or you could just go, you know what? One of the things I could do to help my husband today is pick up his jeans and put them in the hamper because it doesn't seem to bother him, but it bothers me. So I've cleaned up my area. I'm happy and I love that I got to serve him a little bit. Those things you can do just by learning some different techniques. And that's when I say I've modernized leadership philosophy is I've helped take leadership philosophy and teach people these techniques for how to move beyond ego, whether it's my book, Reality Based Leadership, or my book, No Ego. I even wrote one for employees and how they can do it in Reality Based Rules of the Workplace. It's so teachable. Let's take a bit of a reset. This is Jessica Miller-Merrill, and you're listening to the Workology Podcast. Today, we're talking with Cy Wakeman, She's the author of Reality Based Leadership, and we're ditching the drama today. You can follow Cy on Twitter at Cy Wakeman. It's at C Y W A K E M A N. I love this. I, I feel like really that there's so many good pieces. Uh, let me let me go back to women for a minute. Um, what do you say? I feel like we have way too much to do and we always have the weight of the world on our shoulders and so many things are happening to us. We're juggling work, family, friends, social media. How, how do you, what do you recommend for some, for a woman to be able to manage that all? I believe that work-life balance isn't a noun, it's a verb, and that we don't need to balance our tasks or our duties or responsibilities. We need to balance our energy and if we are, if we can't get out of something, we need to get completely into it. And so it's an energy piece, but I would tell you there's two ways to go through the day, joy or misery, same day. And when you get rid of your story and drama, it takes a job that feels like you're swimming through mud and the same job can feel like you're walking through air. It becomes effortless in that. But the, the one key I can give women especially is we believe if we say yes to something, a concept, a goal, an idea, we have to do it. We have to be the ones who spearhead it, the ones who make it happen. Then we go to, I'm not going to say yes anymore. I'm going to say no. And then we get limited in our career. Well, I help people separate out, say yes to the idea. I love the goal. I love the concept. It's an amazing strategy. Let's go for it. And then have a separate conversation. Now let's talk about how we could get it done and what the right size of resource would be to put on the task. Because most people believe if I say yes to it, I sign up for it. And then we say no, so we're seen as unwilling. And a quick example, I have um, a son who came to me and he wanted to go to the theater for the evening. And we had already sent you know, the, the bus into town with the kids. And I almost said no to him because I thought if I said yes, I have to get out of my pajamas, 
I you know can't have a glass of wine. I have to wait up for him. I got to go pick him up. And I almost looked at him and said, no, you can't go. Now, that would have been disastrous because he was the last kid standing between my husband and I having an actual night free. And we have eight kids. That never happens. And so I had to back up and I said, absolutely, you can go to the theater. I said, now let's talk about how you're going to get there. And he's like, well, you could take me. I go, that won't work for me. He's like, well, you could pay for an Uber. I said, not in my budget. And he got creative and he's like, well, I can, you know, call around and get a ride from somebody else. I'm like, that's perfect. But too many times as women, if we say yes to something, we believe that it's then ours to do. And that's a key gender difference. Men say yes to a lot of things, never dawns on them. It's theirs to do. So that would be my best tip. Well, Sai, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to talk with us today on the Workology Podcast. Where can people go to learn more about you and, and what you do? Well, I've got my own podcast, No Ego. It's out everywhere, Spotify, you know, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever you um, find podcasts. And then anywhere on social media, at Cy Wakeman, we've got an incredible YouTube channel. People binge watch all the time. Um, but Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, go out and uh, connect with us, follow us, subscribe, and let us know what you're discovering and the, the things that are most helpful to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. You bet. Thank you. I think it's really important for women to go beyond the ego narrative. And Sai gives us some really good nuggets of wisdom, tips, and a way to embrace yourself, stop judging, and start helping. That's really what we need to do to be able to be successful at work and life and be supportive of one another. Thank you for joining the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. This is the special Women at Work series continuation. My name is Jessica Miller Merrill. Until next time, you can visit Workology.com and listen to all our podcast episodes. Production services for the Workology Podcast with Jessica Miller Merrill provided by TotalPicture.com.